Hi, my name is Andrew Schroeder. I'm a pulmonary doctor in Beverly Hills. I have a special interest in lupus. I'm here today on a live video chat to answer questions as they come in in connection with Lupus LA. So the first question I think is a very good one and it has to do with how do I differentiate chest pain uh, between chest wall pain that would be something that someone with autoimmune disease, specifically lupus, would have and having COVID. So, you know, everyone's a, everyone's a little different and we all live in our own bodies and autoimmune disease is very tricky. Um, so, I, you know, first of all, you know your body probably better than any, any of the doctors who take care of you. Um, so if you've had pleuritic chest pain before, you'll know that it usually is localized and you can trigger it by taking a deep breath. People with COVID, which affects the respiratory lining of the airways, have an increased work of breathing because of the inflammation in the lungs. So if you're, if you're having a central chest tightness or you're just feeling like it's hard to take an inhalation without the searing pain of, of pleurisy, that would be a good way to differentiate. With that said, obviously, please get in touch with your doctor and get some diagnostics starting out with a lung exam and a chest exam where someone pushes on your chest wall. If pushing on your chest wall elicits pain, it's probably pleurisy or chest wall pain related to autoimmune disease and not COVID. Okay. There are, so uh, to reiterate the question, um, how do we manage masks? Um, what type of masks are there and, and when is the appropriate time to wear a mask? Um, breaking them down into two categories, there's what we would call a simple face mask or a procedure mask um, that is something that is not um, designed to protect you from an infection coming in. It's designed to protect other people from what you're expelling. So those can be easily purchased or made um, and that's what we would refer to as a simple mask. A protective mask is something like what you've heard about the N95, the N100. Those are designed to protect the wearer from particulate matter that's in the air, including viruses. Those have to be specially fitted. And if it's not leaving a line on your face, it's not working. So those are very difficult to wear. I've worn them for hours at a time in the hospital and those are appropriate for hospital settings. Um, the, first, uh, the first step in wearing a mask is for us to protect other people. So if I'm sick and I cough, a cough, um, depending on the particle size, will land three to six feet away from me. If somehow I sneeze and I aerosolize things, they can float around in the air and there's been different studies, but we could estimate for hours. I think that's hard to do um, when you're in public unless you're really sneezing your head off. Basic conversations, have very little particulate matter coming out of our mouths. Um, but but um, a caveat is yelling, singing, laughing, those aerosolized things. So why do, meat, why do the meat packers um, that work in the, in the plants uh, get COVID so easily? Because they're all yelling, because it's loud inside, there's machines going, and yelling produces more particulate matter coming out of their mouths. Why do choirs get it? The choir in Washington State, where everyone got infected at a high rate, it's because they're singing. So back to the main kind of practicality of it, when you're leaving your house, abide by local, um, we're in the county of Los Angeles, but I'm sure there are others in other places, abide by local um, restrictions. But I, I really think everyone should wear a face covering right now as respect, out of respect to other people because you may be asymptomatic and possibly spreading it. I don't think it's, it's practical or realistic to think that wearing an N95 when you're going to the market is really gonna help. And to be honest with you, I'll bet you most kind of private citizens haven't had a fitting test, don't know what size N95, and don't even know if the thing they got on the internet is an actual N95. So wear it when you're out in public, um, and if you're, if you're separated or if you're out on the street or a trail or something, for example, when I'm running, 
I'll have, I, it's hard to exercise in a face mask. If there's no one around, I take it off. If there's someone getting close to me, I manage it by putting it on and out of courtesy to that other person. And then obviously I try to avoid them anyway. So I hope that answers the question. The question is how are patients with asthma managing the virus? In my patient population, the patients are doing pretty well. And I, I think I was accused of being an alarmist early on, uh, but I stopped up my asthma patients with their medications in early March and told them to self-isolate. Um, we've had some pollen in the air over this time uh, during, you know, during COVID when it's been increasing, but surprisingly asthma patients have been doing pretty well. And I think it's because we're all taking kind of a germ cleanse, right? We're not passing around the usual infections that people are getting. So I've seen a lot less asthma. Um, the question is, how does lupus most commonly affect the lungs? Um, I'm having an explosion in the middle of my brain right now and I'm trying to organize my thoughts. Um, so lupus obviously being an autoimmune disease um, will, will affect breathing. So let's just say breathing. A lot of the times when a, when a patient with lupus comes to my office for consultation, there's a breathing issue that turns out not to be their lungs. It turns out to be their chest wall because there's a lot of connective tissue and muscles there or their diaphragm, which is the main breathing muscle for respiration. So when a, when a lupus patient comes to my office with respiratory complaints, it, I can't just think about the lungs themselves. So a lot of the time it turns out to be chest wall issues. And I report back to the rheumatologist that that's the issue. And then we, we focus on increasing treating the underlying disease. If you wanna get a, a layer further in, then we're looking at the lungs themselves. Lupus can cause uh, a variety of things and we can break it down into two categories. One is it can help that the treatment of lupus, which is immunosuppressive, can increase our risk of infections. So that's something that's always on my mind um, once we rule out chest wall issues. So we can do that by taking a proper history, by culturing anything people cough up, by doing a good chest exam. And then um, lastly, we can do imaging through either x-ray or CAT scan. The next thing is lupus can cause fibrosis to happen in the lungs. And I've seen that in my practice as well. And that's the result of, of immune cells misbehaving in the lung tissue, destroying lung tissue and causing small scars. So that becomes, that's one of the most serious complications. Um, and that, you know, that's something where I will call the rheumatologist and say, let's intensify the lupus treatment. And then lastly, vascular issues can, can happen with lupus where the blood pressure in the lungs gets too high and we need to figure that one out. And that's done with other testing, including heart testing. And lastly, vascular issues of blood clots. So lupus can put some patients at a higher risk for blood clots in the autoimmune spectrum. So, you know, that's a special type of presentation. It's more sudden, it's not gradual, but that's also on my mind if there's blood clots in the lungs. Next question. Um, the question was, are lupus patients with lung involvement more likely to catch COVID? Um, I'm going to say no, because lupus patients are smart and lupus patients know that their health really matters. And I think if there's any population of patients, it's lupus patients who are uh, adhering to strict guidelines and removing themselves from risky situations. So I think behavior is very, very important. And that's what's going to protect all of us. And here in California, that's what's been working so far. Um, if, if a lupus patient was standing in a room and a non-lupus patient was standing in the room and someone with COVID walked in, would that lupus patient uh, be at a higher risk? The honest answer is, I don't know. Um, it depends on what kind of medicine they're on and it depends on their underlying lung issues. If it's a patient, if it, and this goes for any patient, if there's a patient that has any underlying lung disease, a COVID infection is gonna make that, that worse. And it's gonna, it's gonna dig them into a deeper hole before we can get them out of it. So the next question is what signs or symptoms should a lupus patient uh, monitor for lung involvement? 
Um, you know, people have pulse oximeters. Um, there are caveats with lupus because if you have Raynaud's, your pulse oximeter is not going to work well. Um, so that can be a real kind of, you know, I've already dealt with that problem with a couple of patients who have contacted me. Um, so you can get bad data from a pulse oximeter. So that puts that, you know, that takes away a tool. Um, the, the main advice is to, is to, you know, test your body and see how you feel. And depending on how regimented you are, I have some patients who will do a workout, and especially if we're at home and we're using machines and that sort of thing, you'll know how long you went on the treadmill, uh, you know, on Tuesday. On Wednesday, if there's a decrement and you have increasing shortness of breath or you have cough, those are things to let your doctor know about. So it, it becomes a decrease in exercise capacity is the way I would think of it. But I think for the average person, it just means you can't do as much or you're getting more winded. That is specific, that's, that, I, I'm, I'm kind of starting on the second step. The first step is actually, are you coughing and do you have fever? Um, some people can't really mount a fever because of immunosuppression, uh, but everyone's gonna cough. So cough and decreased exercise capacity. Uh, the next question is what brings on pleurisy and how is it treated? So pleurisy, um, the strict definition of pleurisy is inflammation on the inside of your chest wall. The inside of your chest wall has a ton of nerves. And if anyone who, who's had pleurisy knows that, um, and having done procedures on chest walls and that sort of thing, if it's not under general anesthesia, when I was doing procedures on chest walls, I would use so much local numbing that it, it would seem insane. But there's so many nerves on the inside of the chest wall. Right next to the inside of the chest wall is the lung and it has a lining, the lung doesn't have sensory nerves. It's crazy. You can cut into the lung, no one will ever feel it. So it's really the inside of the, it's the inside portion uh, that, that is, rubbing against, is rubbing against the lung. The lung slides, okay? So they're, they're connected, but they're sliding against each other, the chest wall and the lung. So when that interior lining of the chest wall is inflamed and the lung slides against it, it hurts and it hurts really bad and it's, a, it's usually described as a tearing, a burning, um, and it makes people not wanna breathe even. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of people are taking you know, more shallow breaths and putting them at risk for other, other things that can happen when you're not fully expanding your lungs. Next question. So the next question is, does COVID-19 affect what are called the alveoli? or the great clusters down at the very bottom of the lungs um, where the oxygen exchange takes place. It takes your trachea splitting 17 times usually to get down to these little microscopic um, areas. So the answer is, depending on how far the COVID gets, yes, it does affect that part. Those are the people who become critically ill. And the interesting thing is, a lot of times when you've gotten to that point, the virus wants to get into respiratory cells and replicate and run, you know, run its viral program. By the time you're down in those alveoli and gas exchange is being affected, we think that, you know, and you're in an intensive care unit, we think that the immune system itself is more of a culprit than the actual virus. So COVID gets the party started, but by the time you're having gas exchange abnormalities, you're probably dealing with a cytokine storm, which is your own immune system responding. Um, next question is, can you explain shrinking lung and how would you know if you're a lupus patient experiencing it? I've only seen shrinking lung a few times. Um, I think a lot of, of diagnoses have to be ruled out. Um, I don't know the pathophysiology of shrinking lung besides the obvious where it's getting smaller. Um, but remember, there's a, there's, a, there's a push and pull in breathing. The, the lung is always trying to shrink. The lung always wants to collapse. So if we get a poke in our, in our chest wall and, we, and air gets introduced into our chest wall, all of a sudden the lung goes, zoom, okay? And it, and it gets you know, to a fifth of its normal size or even smaller. So it's always trying to shrink and the chest wall is always trying to pull away. So there's this tension between the two. So part of it is the mechanics of what is the chest wall doing and how much is this lung shrinking in? So there are fibrotic processes there, but I'll bet you that there's pro probably more than one 
you know, pathophysiology there, but it has to do with increased connective tissue in the lung. So the next question is, what is the difference between pleuritic and I think pleuritic chest pain or pleurisy and pulmonary hypertension? So one is the pleurisy that I just talked about where there's inflammation on the inside of the chest wall. Lupus likes to pick different random places to cause inflammation and somehow it picked the inside of a chest wall and it creates pain and that's inflammation that, that can be, you know, that we have ways of dealing with. Um, the other pulmonary hypertension has to do with blood flow through the lungs. So the blood returns to the heart it goes through the right side of the heart and it gets pumped through the lungs so we can oxygenate it. Then it goes back to the left side and then out to the body to feed all the muscles and everything else. The problem with pulmonary hypertension is those blood vessels that it has to get through from the right side of the heart so we can reoxygenate blood get tight. And um, we don't know exactly why that happens. Uh, obviously it's our own immune system doing it. Um, and there are a lot of other reasons outside of autoimmune disease that can cause this, um, but it's, it's actually a pretty serious uh, condition where the last time I fully reviewed pulmonary hypertension, I realized that, that the, the most appropriate treatment for pulmonary hypertension is via a team at a major medical center. So if someone has pulmonary hypertension that I can't handle with simple medication, which would be one to two pills a day, I always refer them to a major medical center where they have a team that includes nurses, other um, technical staff, cardiologists, and, um, and pulmonary doctors working along with rheumatology. Next question. Uh, the question is, does acute lupus pneumonitis always become chronic. I don't know the literature on that, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, I wouldn't mind dealing with acute lupus pneumonitis because we can zap it, but I would have to refer to a rheumatologist to give you the stats on what is your chance of having chronic lupus pneumonitis after an acute episode. Next question. Uh, the question is, should every lupus patient go to a pulmonologist? Um, I don't think necessarily that that is something that someone would need. I think it depends on a person's comfort level with, with the environment where they're getting care. And the, the level of care varies by location. So, you know, I think a, a very good internal medicine doctor along with a very good rheumatologist can handle it. And remember, when, when someone gets the diagnosis of lupus, all organs are up for grabs. So, you know, I take care of one organ. Um, so, you know, in my world, everyone with lupus has lung issues, but I, I really don't think that's the case. So I think it's time, time is better spent um, looking at a bird's eye view of all, of all of the organ systems, working with a really good internal medicine doctor and a rheumatologist. So, the blanket answer to that question is no, not every, not every lupus patient should see a pulmonologist. Next question. Um, the question was, do you think lupus patients should increase their intake of vitamins such as D and B12? Um, the answer is that depends on where you're starting from. That depends on your behavior. Um, so I don't think pushing vitamins necessarily would, would give you um, a, a higher amount of protection. Our protection is more in how we behave, uh, but I don't, I haven't read literature on that, so I can't give you a great answer. Next question. Uh, the question is, do you still need a mask if you're walking and social distancing? And my answer to that is yes, um, because you're showing respect to the other person you're with and you're decreasing your chance of getting someone sick. Next question. The next question is, what can COVID-19 patients with lupus who have undergone what sounds like intensive care or serious illness expect in, in how they're healing? 
Um, I think the jury is still out on that. Um, we're learning more and more about the virus and kind of the sequelae or after effects um, as we see more patients. Currently, the institution that I'm connected with um, has seen, uh, you know, in the high 300s. Um, other places in the nation have been hit harder. In general, if you have had critical illness that includes intubation and pneumonia, it's a long road to recovery. And if there's scarring in your lungs afterwards, um, you're gonna have to compensate in other ways and you will lose lung function. To put that in perspective, I always say that we're overbuilt when it comes to lungs. There are people who walk around with one lung. There, there are, you know, a good metaphor would be if it's an engine, it's a 12 cylinder engine that we're born with, usually we need six cylinders. So will it cut down on your high performance marathon running? Yes, but I think in day-to-day -day life, there are a lot of people who have scar tissue in their lungs that they don't even know about. And you know, it, the, the road after critical illness is long, but the lungs probably won't be the limiting factor. It's more about the muscle that people lose and the cardiac function that could, that could go down as well. Next question. Does COVID leave scars in the lungs of people who recover from it? Only if the lung really gets chewed up. Um, only if there's what we would call necrosis. Um, so the answer is really on an individual basis and it depends on the, the magnitude of the disease. But if I think if people are staying out of the intensive care unit and they're not intubated, I wouldn't expect for them to have any sort of, of life altering scarring that you could ever see on a CAT scan. Next question. I love these questions. Um, so the next question is, what is the difference between pneumonia and pneumonitis and can pneumonitis be seen in an x-ray? So, you know, this is why I had to go to medical school because it gets a little confusing with the language. Pneumonia itself, when you say the word, suggests that there's an infection involved. So there has to be either a virus or a fungus or a bacteria causing problems. So that's pneumonia. That's the one everyone knows about. Pneumonitis is suggesting that there is inflammation in the lung. There's no infection. There's no fungus. There's no bacteria. There's no virus. And that's, of course, what we're dealing with with autoimmune disease, right? No inciting factor besides your own immune system. So is pneumonitis, you know, can you see pneumonitis on an x-ray? You can't see it very well at first, but if things get out of hand, of course you can see it on an x-ray. Usually if that's the case, um, you're in enough extremis and in a, having a hard enough time breathing that you're probably in an emergency room at that point. Um, I have had patients where I've seen it on an x-ray who, who don't need to be hospitalized, but if it gets to the x-ray stage where it's pretty easy to see, you're getting a higher level of medical care. Next question. Um, there's a lot of back and forth on the, the answer to the next question. So does Plaquenil protect you from, from uh, COVID? And there were early studies that showed that Plaquenil changes the pH in a cell. They make it harder for the virus to replicate. It makes it harder for the virus to latch onto a cell. I have personally given hydroxychloroquine to several COVID patients. And the reason I did that is because it's the only pill available to do anything. And, and there really is a reason behind giving it. Um, before I gave it to those patients, I had to insist that I looked at their most recent EKG and either I had it because they were my own patient or because in this crisis I'm seeing so many patients, I would you know, talk to their cardiologist or their primary doctor. So you know, I think um, hydroxychloroquine got some bad press um, and the, you know, they highlighted cardiac issues. This is what doctors deal with all the time. So welcome to being a doctor. These are the things we think about before we give medicine. Um, but you know, in my opinion, hydroxychloroquine has kept active COVID patients out of the hospital. And the NIH just funded a study studying exactly that. Does hydroxychloroquine along with, with um, azithromycin keep people out of the hospital? So we're gonna get that answer. So coming in for a landing and telling, you know, figuring out does it protect lupus patients? 
my answer is I hope so. Uh, no one really knows. I think if I was on hydroxychloroquine, maybe I would sleep better at night, but I wouldn't take chances and do dumb things like, you know, go buy a round of beer for everyone down at the local bar. I think, you know, you need to continue to practice the social distancing for now. Next patient or next, next question. Yes, there are tons of breathing exercises. The question was, are there breathing exercises we can do to stay strong? And my general answer to this is any exercise that, that makes you breathe. And, 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 you know, it sounds like a silly answer, but it's true uh, because, you know, exercise is individualized, especially in patients with autoimmune disease who may have joint issues and mobility issues. Um, do, the, do the exercise that with the most intensity um, that you can do the best uh, with the most comfort. Not that exercise is comfortable, I'm not selling you that. But if there's some exercise program that you do and you're breathing and you have an increased rate of breathing, you are working on your breathing. There are very many um, kind of YouTube videos and that sort of stuff available on, on the web for free that will help you with breathing exercises. I think you can try those on yourself and see what works. But anything where you're moving air is increasing your, your ability to, or it's, it's keeping your respiratory muscles in shape. Next, next question. Um, this, is, this is a pretty complex question, so I'm gonna break it down. Uh, this is a person saying they have a diagnosis of lupus, endometriosis, and COPD. So COPD is, the, um, is a lung disease that's usually associated with, with tobacco smoke. It's not always associated. It can be occupational as well, or it can be from secondhand smoke as well. Um, COPD uh, affects airways by increasing inflammation in its own way outside of any autoimmune disease. So it's another heightened state of inflammation in people's lungs, which makes it harder to breathe and harder for your lungs to self-clean and fight infections. Endometriosis is um, an illness where the uterine lining that should come out the bottom during the time of the month actually goes north, comes out of the fallopian tubes and makes a home on, in the abdominal cavity and kind of sprinkles itself around the intestines, other organs, and on the abdominal wall. So this becomes a painful condition depending on hormone flux. And when the hormones are telling the uterine lining to get big, those little pockets of tissue get big and they cause a lot of problems, including pain. So can endometrial tissue that causes endometriosis get into the chest cavity? The answer is yes. And, and I've seen that a uh, handful of times in my practice, not necessarily for autoimmune disease, that, that doesn't have to go hand in hand with autoimmune disease. Um, so the main issue with that is that it can cause a pneumothorax and that's called a catamenial pneumothorax, which is a fancy way of saying that um, around the time of the period, the, there's a, a pop in the lung and the lung collapses. So I just went to the worst possible case I don't, you know, I've seen that a couple of times in my practice. I'm up to a million patient visits, believe it or not. Um, so I just went with the worst case. I think the honest answer is you're going to be fine. I don't think your endometriosis, you know, there's a low probability that your that the the endometrial tissue will make it into your chest into your chest cavity, but it is possible, and they would it would sneak through pores in the diaphragm. So I, I think that got extra technical and wordy, but that that's kind of the mechanism. And I think your chances of, of having to deal with that are low. The way for someone with COPD to breathe better is to be on COPD, the proper COPD medicine, which is widely available. It's very well studied. There's not a lot of deviance as to what the correct uh, way of treating that is. Just for, for fun, let's do one more bonus question. Uh, the question is, is COPD rate related to lupus? The answer is no. A totally different, it's a different, um, it's a different set of inflammatory mediators. So getting lupus doesn't mean you're going to get COPD. The, the COPD came from something else. 
So I think that wraps it up. So, so I'd just like to thank all of you for participating in this and, and, and listening to me. And um, I, I am on Facebook, so if there's a way to communicate through Lupus LA, they're gonna let me know and they'll let you know and I'm happy to answer any other questions uh, via that format. And I'm saying goodbye.